Good evening and uh, welcome you all to our third session of uh, Take Off in Tech series. And in the first half of this session, uh, I'll be sharing you some practical insights on how to choose the right online course to grow your skills as a software engineer and also uh, learn to set the realistic learning goals and get some tips on how to ensure your personal uh, optimal learning experience. Uh, first, uh, let me introduce myself. Okay, uh, my name is Nisasila Bandare and I'm an expert software engineer working in Zuki for more than a year now. And I started my career as a software engineer more than 10 years back. And initially, my main focus was on C Sharp.net and Oracle uh, PLSQL Stack Stack. And then, since I started liking uh, mobile application development, mainly the uh, Android apps using Java and Kotlin, uh, which has then become my main area of uh, expertise. And also, I have experience in other cross platform mobile uh, tech stacks like Flutter. And my current area of focus is on Java Spring Boot for uh, back end development. Uh, and also, supply chain management, uh, banking and finance, and government sector, et cetera, are some of the uh, functional domains that I worked so far. And as I just mentioned, uh, uh, during my leisure time, I enjoy doing watercolor paintings and pastel arts, and I do love chocolates. So, this is basically about myself. Uh, let me tell you a bit about my uh, past learning uh, experience. So throughout my career, I have been uh, signing up for several online courses uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, sometimes it is to achieve the success or a breakthrough in my career. And at times, I was looking for something new to pursue because personal growth is exciting and uh, I love learning. So let's see what went wrong and the lessons learned. Okay, yep. So choosing an online course that fits as well and ensures an optimal learning experience is uh, crucial because uh, we'll be putting a decent amount of our time, effort, as well as our money into that one course. So we have to make sure that we invest our time and money uh, wisely. But uh, there are times I also ended up spending money on courses that are not really suitable for my purpose. Uh, uh, that are not really suitable for my purpose. So whenever I start to find a course, I always get really confused which one to choose. Uh, as there are a vast number of online courses and platforms for learning, ranging from free to slightly expensive and then completely out of my budget. So uh, we all have a willingness to simply look for a course that matches our current needs. So uh, I also spread all this I was browsing an optimal course in many platforms, and then finally, I also ended up spending money on a course that is not really suitable for my purpose and preferences. Sometimes, uh, if I see uh, some discounts or any on ongoing promotions, or whenever I see a course uh, with a useful content, I tend to purchase it as well. And then later on, uh, sometimes I don't even open that course at all. Uh, I think I'm not alone here because research shows that uh, many people just do this kind of uh, impulse buying of online courses as well. Because when purchasing, we all think that we will succeed. And then later on, sometimes we just keep on uh, that course untouched for ages, uh, simply because we purchase without any planning in advance. So, and also there are times after purchasing and going through the course halfway, I started realizing that it doesn't uh, help me uh, filling up my skill gaps or achieving the learning outcomes or either. I started feeling bored due to the course content and structure. So, uh, So the lessons learned throughout my online learning is that if we have a better understanding of our motivation and why we need to enroll an online course, then the probability of completing the course and learn the learn the course uh, outline and learn the course content uh, will be high. And it's important that we take a moment to consider which course will bring us the most success uh, by identifying our preferences and reading the course content thoroughly. So uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so based on my uh, past experience, uh, 
uh, today I'm going to share some of the steps which I feel will be useful for you as well. Before that, let's have a quick poll. Uh, Crimson, could you help me? Okay. Uh, great. I, I see that we have uh, only yes as the answer. So those who are, uh, the people who already followed any online courses before, hope you will learn some new tips to make your next online course experience, uh, learning experience an optimal one. And for those who haven't uh, followed any online courses yet, hope this session will motivate you to sign up for more online courses for continuous learning. Uh, let's move on to step one. Yes, the most essential factor when choosing an online course is picking up a topic you have a great deal of interest in. Sometimes we are quite clear of the topic we want to study, or maybe sometimes uh, we are also in a doubt. So even if we know uh, what we really want to learn, uh, it is always good to think of why we want to learn it, uh, what are the learning outcomes, and also our skill gaps quite well. Then the probability that we will make it to the end of the course will be high. So as the first step, it's always good to decide why you want to uh, sign up for a course. So finding a very good reason for learning the new skill or leveling up your skill set. Um, and do we want to call, do we want to uh, want a course to learn some new skills to land a better job, or do we want to uh, improve our skills for our career growth, or a course that is endorsed by a professional body to highlight our profile, or maybe a course just for fun uh, to pass time? That why or that reason can be a little bit deep and maybe uh, somewhat long term. As a compass, it will uh, help us to move towards the direction that is right for us. Then uh, it's always good to set up a goal. This goal then is the specific thing, the learning outcome that is expected after undertaking the chosen course. Uh, everyone at, uh, learns at their own pace. So it's important that we set a realistic goal so that we don't uh, become discouraged along the way. So as a binocular that zooms into a, uh, zooms into a uh, give us a clear view, this goal will help us to uh, see something uh, in the distance and can work our way towards it. So once we are clear of our goal, we have to try to un uh, identify the skill gaps to reach our set goal. Those missing puzzle pieces will become our roadmap that guides us towards the goal. So once we are clear of why we want to learn it and what are the learning outcomes and also uh, our skill gaps, now we can decide our topic wisely based on our goal and the roadmap. So I will uh, give you an example just to summarize what we talk in this slide. So let's say um, your, pur your purpose of learning the course can be something long term. Uh, like become an uh, expert in uh, mobile application development, for example, and your goal can be a short-term one to learn the basics of native Android development uh, first, uh, but uh, you might have uh, already learned in your university the basics of Kotlin programming language and how to create the basic screens in Android and pass the values between the screens, and you have identified networking and the storage in the Android ecosystem are some of the missing pieces or your skill gaps. So you can de uh, define your roadmap based on that to have two uh, items, which is, for example, uh, how to uh, perform a network operation in Android and how to save data in a local database in Android. Now, based on these two items, you can define your topic easily. So throughout these uh, steps, anytime we can get uh, advice and recommendation from someone who already has experience in that area and also being part of a relevant uh, tech stack community or forum can also help because uh, the other members can suggest skills or learning paths for us to investigate. But still, <coughs> yeah. uh, a course of a friend or a colleague recommend us might not be the ideal course for us to get an optimal learning experience because even though the topic is relevant for us, sometimes it might not align with our uh, list of preferences like time and budget, etc. So it's always uh, good uh, for us to identify our preferences to have a more personalized learning experience. 
For that, we can list down our preferences and criteria, which then can check against while browsing the courses. The so first thing is we have to be honest about our time limits. Even if uh, online course often don't have a deadline to finish it, we don't want to let that course just remain untouched for months. Uh, we need to have uh, taken us just like 10 to 15 hours in total to complete, the, for example. So we can decide how many hours per week I can spend on this course. Uh, is there any deadline from my side, like a project requirement or an exam, etc., to fi finish this course? And then uh, which and uh, what time of the day I can study? Is it on a weekends or weekdays? Is it on morning or night? So deciding time to locate is essential. Uh, as well as uh, figuring out our budget is crucial too, especially if uh, we are paying for the course ourselves, we should uh, decide how much money we want to spend. Also, based on uh, our purpose, the, our purpose and the end goal, uh, if we want to continue a learning path, then we may consider browsing our courses in a platform with a subscription-based uh, payment. Or if the goal is just a smaller one, we may uh, find a learning platform which we can do a one-time purchase so we can note down our preferred payment model here. Uh, also, if we are achieving, uh, if achieving the career advancement or highlighting our profile is the reason for signing up for this course, then it may be useful to get a course completion certificate or a badge so that we can add it in our LinkedIn profile or provide it to a recruiter during the interview process. So you can decide your preference and note it down if you want to have a certificate. Another important factor is to determine our preferred way of learning. Uh, some people prefer to watch videos while uh, others uh, prefer to read. Sometimes we need to practice uh, that new task a couple of times to fully understand it. But sometimes we can simply just watch someone else doing that and then we are good. So uh, for some people, especially the beginners with basic experience in coding, may prefer interactive sessions while others may prefer recorded sessions so that we can uh, take that in our own pace. Also, based on our past experience, uh, we, uh, we may have our favorite instructors, uh, which we enjoyed and learned a lot by following their courses earlier. So I found it really important to take a moment to think back on our past learning experiences, uh, what type of uh, courses did we really enjoy, and which, one of, uh, which ones did you get the most out of it, and which ones were a waste of time for us. The ones we enjoyed and learned a lot probably share the similar characteristics. And these characteristics we can uh, take into consideration before choosing our uh, new online course to ensure we have a positive and a successful uh, learning experience. And also, based on our past experience and our available timing, we can decide when, we, when and where we wa want to study during the day. So deciding the location is also an essential factor since it will help us to check if that learning platform provides a mobile lab <clears throat> and offline access, etc. Because if our best location to study is while having our lunch at a restaurant or uh, while taking a train back home, then we may appreciate the ability to follow the course using a mobile phone or tablet and having offline access while uh, will become handy as well. So this is just a common set of preferences which may be applicable to most of us, but without limiting to these factors, you can keep, uh, keep the list growing and can make the course more customizable to your needs. <clears throat> so now we have a clear idea of our topic and we do have our <clears throat> list of preferences in hand. So now it's time for us to start exploring courses. Here, <coughs> here we can uh, start browsing ourselves and also we can get recommendations from our colleagues or experts. Uh, choose a course that matches uh, as many of your preferences as possible. If you find several courses that meet your criteria or your preferences list, don't worry, just open each course page because we do a narrow down in the next step. Continuing to next slide. We already have a set of 
uh, course pages open in our browser tabs now and it's time uh, to check each course against our list of preferences or criteria we defined earlier uh, we, uh, we can check the course created and last update to date to make sure that the content of the course is up to date. Uh, this will enable our chance of uh, <clears throat> learning the latest concepts rather than spending time learning something uh, already outdated. Also, uh, I always found it uh, useful to check the top rated and best selling courses. In addition, it's important criteria to consider who created the course. <clears throat> it's always good to select a course developed by a top institution uh, and taught by experts we trust or instructors we prefer because it's always good to learn from professionals apart from the uh, acquired knowledge. They have a better understanding of what might work well for us and what we uh, don't. Uh, therefore, make sure that the course is created by experts in the industry <clears throat> so, so we can uh, gain more insight from them that help us to become um, who we aspire to be. Likewise, uh, if having a professional certificate is, the, <clears throat> is one of our preferences, then we better check if the course we selected issues us an online, issues us a uh, course completion certificate or badge to share in the LinkedIn. Uh, it's always good to add a reputed university or professional body to uh, our resume in order to attract our profile or to positively impact our career. So be, so be wise while choosing. <laughs> Let's see the next step. Okay, what should a course uh, include? to ensure that our learning experience is optimal so that we complete the course and successfully learn the course content. This is the most important factor to consider because each topic can have a wider range of <coughs> courses from those who are with a zero experience on the topic to those who are already working on the, uh, working in that field. So without such an evaluation, we may find ourselves jumping from course to course in a confusion, which may uh, cause frustration and may lead us to give it up later. So it's crucial to take <clears throat> some time to read uh, all about the each course, including the description, syllabus, prerequisites, outcomes, and reviews, etc. So as a first step, read the course prerequisite section to find out exactly who the course is for, to ensure it's the right level for us, because we don't want to end up on a course which doesn't uh, match our experience. Afterwards, uh, read the course description thoroughly to get a better understanding on what is what this course is about, uh, what's there on the course syllabus, you know, what we will learn by the end of the course. Then we can check it against our roadmap and learning outcomes, which we defined uh, and listed in our very first step. And also <clears throat> make sure that course uh, is well structured with uh, sorted sections, curriculum map, and a way to track our progress. I find it really useful to take some time to read the reviews and feedback given by the other learners. This will help us to get a better understanding of the course structure, what it really covers, and what are the missing pieces there. And also, we can get some understanding of the course content and learning style, etc. as well. Uh, next, learning by doing is the most uh, effective and efficient way to absorb the course content. And therefore, it's good to check if the course follows that expert recommended 20-80 ratio, where where the theory takes about 20% and practice takes about 80%. What it means is, for us is that uh, we will uh, spend 20% of our time watching course videos and reading the provided materials, etc., to understand the concepts. And the remaining 80% of our time will be spent on coding. So I found it really beneficial to choose a course where there is a project which we have to build as we learn. By, uh, by reading the description uh, and the review section, and also by watching the course demo videos, we will be able to get some understanding whether this course has a, a project-based uh, learning that is uh, very important. And lastly, in our preferences list, we already note down our preferred way of learning based on our past learning experience. So now we can check against it 
to see if each course supports variety of learning styles so that we have a better chance of understanding the content. Uh, this means that video-based courses that explains every step of the course and also has its transcripts to read and include diagrams and illustrations and colors for clarifying the theory concepts. Uh, this will ensure that more participants uh, can be successful. Specifically, for those who prefer text-based content, uh, transcripts will be really useful to read and follow along as the instructor talks. And also for everyone, it will be helpful uh, when we don't uh, clearly hear what the instructor said or when we want to revisit the course for clarification. Then, having uh, visuals and illustrations to emphasize key concepts will surely be useful for better understanding. By watching course uh, demo videos, we will, be, uh, we will be able to get some understanding whether this course has our preferred learning styles. Let's see now, uh, how can we do the finalization? So uh, at this point, we might still be having a few courses that meet our uh, goals and criteria. So I will share some additional tips which we may overlook when we do the uh, further narrow down. So it's always good to make sure that uh, the course allows problem solving and uh, practical uh, experience. Without practical skills in coding and problem solving, we may uh, experience difficulties when it comes to uh, working on a real project. So uh, check if we get to uh, accomplish quizzes and the uh, other core challenges to strengthen our knowledge throughout the course. This enables us to uh, solve the problem on our own and can keep us busy and motivated. And also, this will help us to know how well we, uh, we are understanding the course content. Next is, uh, next, it's always good to get uh, your course reviewed to avoid any mistakes and uh, uh, or identify those on time, and uh, even learning uh, learning coding best practices as early as possible. This way, we can learn from the mistakes and make uh, make your code cleaner the next time. So, if we can get our code uh, challenges or the projects reviewed either by a mentor assigned to, to us or uh, at least by a tool, this feature will come in handy when shortlisting the courses. Another point to overlook when evaluating is. Uh, the access to the downloadable materials. This is important so that we don't need to come back to the course every time we need to refer something. So it's always worth it to check if course has downloadable resources like cheat sheets, practical coding examples, troubleshooting guidelines, etc. Furthermore, uh, if we feel uh, if we if we feel more comfortable when we know there is someone we can rely on if we get stuck while we are working on the course. That is uh, why it's always worthy to choose a course with a strong and supportive community that brings uh, students together. So check further if the platform has a forum where we can get our questions answered promptly and seek help whenever needed. Last but not least, when we follow the course modules in um, most of the courses, we see our progress for each module and motivational pop-ups after each challenge. These benchmarks help us to uh, motivate and encourage us to move forward. So some courses even have built-in benchmarks because each module of the course is building another part of the software. These benchmarks are like short-term goals and completing them makes us feel accomplished and motivate us to uh, work even harder and get uh, get uh, get to the next benchmarks. Such sense of accomplishment does wonders for our mental health as well, especially since this is going to be an online course without less or zero interaction with the instructors. So it's good to check uh, this uh, in our courses as well. So far, so good. And finally, uh, if we find we still have few courses that meet our criteria. Now we may need to judge whether we have enough time to join and keep up with all uh, of those courses. If we don't think we can, then we can always uh, bookmark them to start later. And choose one course out of it that meets most of our learning outcomes and cover most of our preferences. Uh, this will ensure our learning experience is optimal so that we both complete the course and successfully learn the course content. And now uh, the course is chosen and it's time for us to get ready to start. Let's jump to a new section here. OK. 
Okay, so in our very first step, we decided why we want to sign up for this course, right? So if that reason does not force us to complete the course by a specific date, for example, if the purpose of the of following this course is to upgrade our skills and highlighting our profile, then since external factors are not forcing or impacting our learning speed, we might end up uh, keep delaying our planned schedule. Obviously, it's not uh, admirable, uh, though you can uh, be flexible as to uh, when you have to, uh, when you when you choose to complete uh, your work during the week, you, can, you can't put off forever. So I thought of highlighting you some useful tips to help you to keep going and get the most out of an online course. Before that, let's have another uh, poll quickly. Quincy, could you please help me? Okay. Yeah, again, uh, we have uh, both yes and no. Okay, for those who uh, already purchased any online courses but never got the chance to uh, make your way till the end, hopefully, uh, hope the following section will help you to learn some new tips to make sure that you you successfully learn the course content. And for the rest, I uh, hope this will uh, motivate you to sign up for more online courses and successfully complete that without wasting your money and time and learn its full content successfully at the same time. Let's see that now. Uh, when it comes to online classes, uh, we need to sit down and uh, decide uh, to actually follow through. Uh, here are uh, some of the tips to ensure that uh, complete the that we complete the course and successfully get the most out of it. So. Uh, first one is treating the course as a real face-to-face -face classroom course and remember that we are paying for this course, online course. Hold ourselves to the same standards and make sure we organize, proactive and ready to learn. Then set up a dedicated uh, learning environment for study. Choose somewhere qui quiet, neat and comfortable. By completing your work there repeatedly, you will uh, begin to establish a routine and most importantly, try to avoid distraction as much as possible. Also, uh, create a weekly schedule based on our preferences and make the course a part of our weekly routine. Uh, when making the schedule, we can uh, designate certain uh, uh, hours each week for watching the course videos and completing the hands-on uh, exercises and participating in the forums, etc. At least uh, do a weekly check on your progress because <clears throat> a little uh, self-reflection and adjustments can go a long way. Also, make sure to take all the modules without skipping for, for an enriching experience uh, with a cer certain sense of commitment in mind. <clears throat> uh, set reminders for yourself to complete all tasks and modules because, uh, like in a real classroom, we don't get the constant reminders from our instructors. Furthermore, uh, actively participate in the course online forum to help you better understand the course materials and engage with the fellow learners. Uh, also, we may uh, tend to think online courses are uh, pre-made study notes, which we can come and refer whenever required. Same like taking notes while in a real class, making our own notes in our own words will encourage us to engage with the material even more. Uh, if it's a recorded session, we can pause any time and take notes uh, as we go along. And last but not least, um, the most important tip is practice makes you perfect because uh, this will enable us to uh, solve the problems by ourselves and let us uh, analyze the cause and the effect, understanding the hierarchy and debug and reef factor, which are uh, highly important in the world of programming. Without practical skills in coding and problem solving, we may experience difficulties when it comes to working on real projects. So uh, learn enough theory and practice more and more Repeat this until you, you feel more comfortable with what you learn. Okay. Let's see some recommendations. So there are a couple of learning platforms which I uh, used before. So Pluralsight, Udemy, uh, Coursera, uh, Red, 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 Leach, and 
finally, the Udacity and edX. So, yes. So these are some of the learning platforms which I use. Uh, if you haven't used these platforms before, you can scan these QR codes and uh, check these sites later. Concluding the session, uh, I would like to emphasize the online classes are an excellent choice to help us grow ourselves and fulfill our goals. Though they come with their own unique challenges, steps we, discuss, we just discussed can help us uh, be successful uh, and hope you enjoyed the sharing and uh, learned some new tips and tricks to follow when choosing your next online course and thank you so much for joining us and if you have any questions uh, i would be happy to answer now uh, thank you nisa uh, there are some questions uh, let me okay. share with you yeah uh, can you see that uh, yeah, I can see. Okay, one question is, do you have any recommendations or online courses for fresh graduates? Okay, let me, maybe I'll put it on the chat uh, for people to see. Yep. Um, I'm I'm sending to the chat now question. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Any recommendations from you? Yeah, I can guys. recommend some of the yeah some of the mobile uh, application development related courses which I followed previously. Uh, hope mm -hmm. this will be useful for some of you to as a start. Uh, let me paste it over here. Uh, Nisa, meanwhile, yeah. we are searching for um, your links to share. Um, we have another question. Uh, let okay. me uh, share it with you and listen to uh, chat. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I, I just send it to you. Okay. Do you have any advice for online learning in a group? Okay, online uh, learning in a group. Uh, yeah, maybe can you clarify that question a bit? You mean like... Uh, uh, you, I mean, sort of uh, friends gather together and start an online course, or? Oh, yeah. I think it's uh, it means like when you're um, studying together with your friends, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that way I think we still can start an online. Uh, I think some of the sites, there are some platforms that suppose the uh, uh, group uh, online courses as well, but I'm not very sure. Let me uh, check that and ping in the chat. And there is a last question from Ashish. Mm, what's your favorite online platform courses? Okay, for me, uh, I like uh, Pluralsight and Udemy. And also uh, for the mobile related, I uh, mostly use for Android is the Udacity. Hmm. Yeah, I, I already posted uh, those links, which I some of the courses which I followed earlier. So, mm -hmm. useful. yeah, thank you so much, Nisa. Uh, it was insightful uh, knowledge sharing. Thank you. Um, thank you. And the next, uh, our next guest speaker is Brendan. He um, he is our so uh, advanced software engineer. And uh, he is currently working um, in um, as a uh, backend engineer, and uh, most of the time he uh, shares his knowledge about Arduino and uh, other things like organizing and any different events. And today, he kindly agreed to uh, do the sharing um, with us. Uh, Brendan, over to you. Hi. Thank you. Okay, so good evening. Welcome to this um, session on getting started with Arduino for IoT. We hope you had an insightful session with our colleague, um, Nisa, on how to choose online courses to further your knowledge. Um, Brandon, for this session, we are going to have an introductory look at Arduino and how we can use it in IoT projects. 
So, but before we dive further, let me begin with an introduction of myself. Um, I'm an advanced software engineer at Zuka for almost two years now, and I'm also a full stack engineer. I've been in this line of work for about 10 years, having started out as a freelance developer. I have worked on different projects, as you can see here, digital payment, aerospace, healthcare, and public security. And I also enjoy writing, working with electronics, and building things with Lego. The re and recently, I have started working on and messing around with IoT and Arduino to um, expand my skill set. I also love, uh, as I mentioned, I love Legos, right? So to some, they may be a type of toy, but to me, they are like a building material. So I use it to build uh, my projects and I actually stuff Arduinos in them and uh, make them do things that I want. So I will share with you some of the charge pictures um, in the next few slides. And last but not least, I love cats, but in Singapore, you can't have them, especially if you live in HDB. So if you'd like to get in touch with me, I have included links to my GitHub and LinkedIn uh, below. You can scan the QR code to get there. And so now that we are done with uh, self-promotion, let's see what we will be discussing today. So for today, we will have a short introduction to Arduino, what we can use it for and where, but um, having theoretical knowledge is not good enough. So we will look at um, how to develop for it. So I will do a quick coding session, as well as um, you get to see some demos, um, things that I've built. And last but not least, we will end the session with a FAQ. So, but before we go any further, I would like to ask you a quick question. Grimsley? Oh, that's awesome. I see that majority of you have no ex experience with Arduino. And so I hope this session will be a good one for you to learn something. So let's get on with the show. So you may, want, you may be wondering what is an Arduino? Well, it is an electronic machine that consists of two parts, a circuit board and a program to tell the board what to do. And the idea is um, this is to enable non-programmers like those in visual arts and new media to learn about programming and as well as creating something exciting, new and flashy with it. And so that's the, that's the main idea. And in the next slide, we will get to see like what are some of the Arduinos available on the market. So we have the small ones, which is the micro, and the newer version, which is the Nano 33 IoT, which is uh, internet capable. We have the Arduino Zero all the way to the Arduino Mega, which is the classic Arduino. And for them, their prices can range anywhere between $20 to $40 USD depending on the size and the features that you're looking for. And you may be wondering what you can create with these things. Well, let's have a look, shall we? So for one, we can have a Arduino-based obstacle avoiding robot car, where you can see there's a ultrasonic sensor at the top mounted and connected to the Arduino. And with that, you, know, you can get the car to uh, detect obstacles in front of it and then avoid it. Um, for some of the more advanced version would be to create a music synthesizer, like on this side, the Polyscene. Um, I have included links to these projects below, which um, you can actually browse and explore. And finally, I have my own mini project, which is a plant watering system, which as I mentioned before, I use Lego as the building block and I stuff Arduinos in there. Um, design some circuitry myself and some buttons and all that. And uh, the links can be found at my blog below. So you can explore that if when you have the time. So now what's next? 
Next, let's do a physical walkthrough of the hardware. So you know like uh, what is on it. Give me a moment while I switch the screen. Okay, I believe now you should be able to see the Arduino lying on the desk over here, right? So this is an Arduino Uno R3, which is one of the um, Arduinos that you see in the gallery earlier. And for the sake of time, I won't be covering the whole hardware here. I'll just cover three main things. The first one will be the microcontroller over here. This is the brain of the Arduino. And for the Uno R3, this is the 80 mega, 3 to 8, which is a 8-bit based microcontroller. It has 32 KB of flash memory, 1 KB of EEPROM, and 2 KB of SRAM. So flash memory is where you store the, um, the program. The EEPROM is where you store data. Um, and the SRAM is basically the main RAM. And Different Arduino will actually use different type of microcontroller. So, um, and they can affect what kind of libraries uh, it will run. And next, we will have a look at the digital pin over here. So these digital pins are the main input output um, pins where they can be used to control sensors, photos, and various other um, add-ons. Um, they can read and write data from such sensors as well as um, if you choose to, you can also write them to um, OLED displays. And depending on the Arduino, um, this can output either a 3.3 volt or a 5 volt for a logical one and a 0 volt for logical 0. And for the Uno, um, it's a 5 volt device. So all the pins here will be running at 5 volts. And the next pin is actually, uh, the next thing that we are interested in is the um, analog pins here. There are seven of them, as you can see, from A0 to A5. Um, these are read-only. They cannot be used to output any data. And it is is connected to a onboard um, analog to digital converter, which will map the voltage level between 0 to 1023. And by voltage level, it can range anywhere between 0 to 5 volts. So let's say if you have a 3.3 volt, um, it will maybe map to a value of 900, something like that. So yep. And with that, let's um, move on. So here, you can see a highly detailed um, breakdown of the hardware. Um, I wouldn't be spending too much time on this, but here you can see some of the main thing. Okay. And let's um, move on. So now that we've seen the hardware, but it's time to do some development. And before we get there, uh, let's introduce, let me introduce you to what you can use, what are the tools you can use to do development on the Arduino. So let's start with the Arduino IDE. So this is an official IDE created by the Arduino uh, company. Um, it's a Java IDE, Java-based IDE. It supports, um, it's, you can run it on Windows, Mac, Linux, and Chrome OS. Um, one thing is uh, it comes with a C++ library called wiring. This um, wiring library is actually what allows you to uh, work with electronics. So all the um, hard work of uh, communication on the uh, hardware is now done in within like uh, wiring. And so when you have finished development on the Arduino IDE, you can compile and deploy codes to the boards with ease. It's just a few clicks of buttons and you are done. Um, the only problem is there is no integrated source control and no code. Uh, no code auto completion, which means for a developer that might actually reduce your productivity and 
well, you may have to struggle, especially when the codes like if you don't have a auto completion, you have to look out at the manual or reference guides. Um, as for source control, well, it means that you need to initialize your own Git repository repository separately and commit the changes from there. Um, but of course, if you like something more powerful, right? There's always Visual Studio Code. Uh, this is a general source code editor created by Microsoft. It is supported on Windows, Mac, and Linux. But for Arduino development, um, it's not supported right out of the box. You will need a extension, the platform IO, um, which the link is provided here. Um, you actually have to install that uh, before you can start. And um, the good thing about Visual Studio Code is it's highly extensible. You can have different kinds of extension, plugins. You can change the fonts and whatnot. It's configurable as well. It has an um, integrated source control, has code auto completion, um, but um, this will not be used in this session. Okay. And so, what kind of programming language do we use for Arduino? Well, it's a C++, C dialect. Okay. And it supports only basic arrays, um, certain primitive types like integer, float, long, char, boolean, and loops, as well as loops, uh, for loop and while loop. Um, there are, of course, other um, functions that you can use right out of the box, uh, but those are specific to the Arduino. And as, as you can see in the screenshot to the right, um, things like digital write, pin mode, um, delay, all these are Arduino specific. So, and um, here's a little trivia for you. An Arduino program is not, it's called a sketch. The reason behind it is that the Arduino IDE is based on a framework, a graphical library called processing, which is actually something created for non-programmers, as I mentioned earlier, the electronic arts, new media, and visual design communities. Um, so that's why, as you know, in those areas, a sketch is basically means something new, something fresh. Um, some, so in this case, calling it a sketch is actually uh, quite suitable. And so with that in mind, now I have another question for you. Uh, Kimsley, can you help me with the poll? Thank you. Okay, I see that quite a number of you are familiar with Java and JavaScript. I suppose that makes sense because those languages are pretty common now and they are taught in school. But um, fear not. If you know Java, C should be relatively easy for you. Uh, so those who know JavaScript, well, mm, just need to work a little bit harder, but it should be no problem. So now let's see. Now let's, uh, we will do an actual coding on the Arduino. And um, give me a moment while I switch over. So I suppose you guys can see these um, Arduino IDE as well as an Arduino sitting on my desk. There's a reason for that later. Um, let me give me a moment while I adjust this. Okay, so so the uh, the goal here for this uh, quick programming session is to create something that we can use to um we can uh, is to create something that allow us to talk to the Arduino and have it respond to us in a in a unique way. Um, basically, on the Arduino, there's this tiny little LED somewhere. Um, on, do you see the L there, the letter L? So that will be the, um, the LED that we'll be working with. So let's start with uh, some programming. And uh, within, for a new, brand new Arduino sketch, what you'll see by default always is uh, these two functions, a setup function and a loop function. So setup function is where you put all your initialization code, your variables and all that stuff here. And once the 
it's done, the, the Arduino will actually execute the loop function. So this is where you put all your logic, okay? So let's start with um, having a, setting up the USB port um, with um, a baud rate of uh, 9600. And because we want to work with the um, LED, we need to initialize the pin mode. We need to set the pin mode. And um, okay, we need to set it as output. Okay, And that's all to it. So next, what we want to do is we want to say, we want to be able to send a command, a hello command to the Arduino and have it respond with a blinking LED. So for a start, let's go with some content. We'll read it from the um, serial input, okay? And um, for this, we will st stop reading the string uh, when it detects a null character. And if then this next thing is um, if the length is zero, okay, let's do a quick check. And um, we will want to see like whether it receive anything. So we can print that out. Okay. And next, what we want is um, to check that it actually says hello. Okay. If it says hello, then what we want it to do is to blink. Okay. And let me format the code. Okay, let's have a function that says hello. Okay. And what do we do next? Let's declare the function. Let's implement it. And then um, to speed up time, I actually prepared it. I'll just, okay, over here, format it. And Let's save it. So before we can compile or do anything, we need to save it. And uh, let's save it to a desktop. Okay. Okay, now that we are done, we can start compiling and deploying to the Arduino, which is why I'm showing you the Arduino there. So let's go. So this is how it compiles. Once it's done, you see that the Arduino will, ha, huh, the Arduino is not responding. Okay, so give me a moment while I stop this. Okay. Let's try again. Okay, so as you can see here, it's done uploading. So we can actually start playing with it. So I'm gonna type a, I'm gonna set it to, um, so there are various options here. I'm gonna set it to no line ending because we only care about a now character. So I'm gonna say hello here. And I'm going to hit enter and keep a lookout at the L, LED over there, okay. You see it, the blinking. So with this, there are very there are many other things that you can do. This is just a quick example, okay. And with that, we can move on. Okay. Now you may be wondering where can we find Arduino? We can always find it in these areas and better environment. 3D printing, smart home. And of course, there's a rare one, which is um, wearables. Now you may be wondering, we have such a big board and how can we use it in a wearable? Well, microcontrollers like these um, 80 mega, three to eight, um, it can also be extracted from the board and um, be installed in a circuit board or something else. And um, from there, you can actually 
run your own circuitry to ensure you know it only draws a very limited amount of power and um, and of course there are other versions of these um, mega three to eight which are even smaller which you can even uh, make it into like a tiny um, the smallest I think you can find is the size of coin so you can actually use that in maybe your clothes and maybe you can create a smart watch if you want and um, yeah so that is that and finally I have another demo to show you how far you can take the Arduino okay and I need to switch again give me a moment okay so now I'm back and here is my own little creation which is a smart light that um, I created and so I actually developed a separate uh, front end and the back end system um, that uses uh, MongoDB as a storage. And um, the idea is I can control the light through this uh, web control over here. So let's say if I want to turn on the light, I can just flip it on and it will turn right on, right? And let's say if I want to change the color, reduce the brightness, I can do that. So I reduce it to 43. And let's say I don't really like red, I want a blue. I can switch to a blue light. And there we go. So this is just a small sample of what you can do. Um, personally, I have intention of building more of these and scatter them around my house so that I can have my own um, my own design lights around okay and I can actually show you like um, like I can do a quick run through so I have an Arduino Nano 10 IoT here um, as well as the LED strip here and um, with some other control logic to ensure you know the LED actually behaves correctly and uh, since this is a prototype behind it's actually pretty ugly in terms of wiring but you know practice make perfect and so yeah that actually concludes my presentation thank you Brandon uh, there are a few questions um, from our attendees. Let me share it with you. Okay. And I will uh, share the questions in, in the chat as well. Okay. Brendan, uh, do you mind uh, sharing yourself in the camera as well? Because now yep. we can see Arduino. Yep, I'm sharing myself. Cool. Is it working? How easy would you say it's to pick up Arduino? Uh, do you see the questions? I would say it's actually very easy uh, because mm -hmm. I also start out with zero knowledge. Um, but um, I would say it's important that you have a goal in mind. So for me, I wanted to create something with Arduino. Um, and so I actually go and buy it and devote mm -hmm. some time into learning it. And then yeah, just go, go from there. There, there isn't really, it's not really very challenging compared to um, other types of uh, projects, like maybe learning music. So this is actually very easy. Mm -hmm. cool. And uh, there is another question. Yep. Um, from where should we start learning about Arduino programming? Uh, um. So for Arduino programming, um, I actually have a page where you can go. Um, okay, for me personally, I actually use um, the Arduino official website. They actually have a lot of um, samples. Okay, and... <laughs> Let me share with you the official site. 
Okay. Yeah. So this on the this is the official site. You can choose to buy Arduino if you want, and they have a lot of doc documentations here, as well as uh, built-in samples. So you can always start from here. Okay. Right. And if let's say you want even more information, you can always go to Reddit. Um, the Arduino Reddit site. The and um, you can see what different people do with Arduino, okay? And some of them even have questions, and they will they will get help from there. And um, a few more questions: uh, Do we get discount buying Arduino at uh, in nine nine sales? Um, probably not. But um, I can recommend you this site, uh, Maker Supply Singapore, if you're based here. Um, you can find your store on uh, Lazada, and you can actually order Arduino from there. And uh, you can have it shipped to your house. <laughs> and if Lazada has 99 sale, I maybe you know Maker Supply might give something there. But as far mm -hmm. as I know, um, no, it's, it's, uh, they don't have 99 sale. But don't worry, it's actually quite cheap. The Arduinos, they will not cost you an arm and a leg. Mm, and there's a last question yep. about Arduino. And does Arduino have any online learning courses? Not that I'm aware of, but you can actually find information like much faster on the Arduino website. They have actually have a forum that is well um, up to date, right? Um, yeah, because I personally have not gone for online courses because to learn about Arduino, it's always best to have the physical hardware and try it yourself, figuring out the different uh, problems or advantage, disadvantage, etc. about the Arduino. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And and we have um, we have received one last question to Nisa. Uh, so, um, Nisa, would you mind to join? Let me share the question with yeah, everyone sure. here. Uh, if uh, there are any tips of taking notes of uh, online courses when you're taking that? Uh, yeah, <laughs> so that's a good question. Uh, when I'm building the project while uh, following the course, uh, I add more notes <clears throat> as comment in my code so that the next time when I come back later, uh, just by looking at the code, uh, I can understand the co code. So uh, that's one way I take notes while uh, following the courses. And uh, if it's related to the theory or any the concepts, then I mostly use this app called Evernote, which is um, one of the most complete notes taking app, I would say, and this app is uh, almost all features that we think of uh, in taking uh, in a note taking app. So these are the two uh, ways I take notes uh, when I'm taking the courses. And I think there are many other tools which you can uh, such as well, like uh, Microsoft OneNote uh, you can use. And also if you are an <coughs> uh, Apple user, you can use the Apple Notes. And for Google Power users, you can uh, use the Google Keep. And uh, there are other tools like Notability and many more. So yeah, basically in my, from my side, uh, Evernote is the one that I use. And for the quotes, I put the comments. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Brendan. Thank you, uh, Nisa. Um, I hope uh, today's session was insightful and uh, helpful with all our attendees. Uh, see you in our uh, future Tech of Intake sessions. Thank you. And have thank a nice you. evening. Yeah, have a nice evening. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye. bye.